and basically his career, and I think it should be very interesting. So I guess without further ado. All right. As he said, we're Solon Skoog, but I take pretty much anything I can get. Um, so everyone here is engineering. Just out of curiosity, like mechanical? Who's looking at mechanical? And then how about electricals? OK. <laughs> um, I, I've been in the race car business for quite a few years, um, kind of in and out. I've been out of it uh, full time since uh, about 10 years ago. And actually, the last six years, I've worked at Oshkosh Corporation as an associate design engineer um, in new product development, which has been uh, extremely exciting for making commercial and military suspension components. You know, some real nice forward thinking um, patented uh, parts. So it's, it's kind of nice. I have a, a few patents to my name um, along with the rest of my group. But um, a couple years ago, I chose to get back in the car racing. Uh, and I do it on just race weekend. Um, uh, to, I, We'll get, we'll get to some pictures later. Um, first off, I apologize for pictures. Hmm. A lot of them were pre-iPhone days. So, um, so as I said, I started off car racing um, actually back in high school. Started off with go-karts. Uh, I don't know if anyone here, anyone doing any sort of go-kart racing? Any type of racing? But SAE, we have some SEA people here, right? Most of you? Half of you? Part of you? OK. So you started off in go-karts, and I uh, kind of got my feet wet there, so to speak, as I'm wearing flip-flops. Um, and uh, it was a good introduction because it was fairly inexpensive racing, and it was an opportunity to just get in and do. And then from that, that, that led to SCCA uh, amateur racing. This was actually from mid-Ohio, early 90s. Uh, finished third there. Uh, I was kind of an owner, operator, engineer, truck driver, race car mechanic, parts cleaner, and gopher. <laughs> I think that's all of them. Um, but it was a really great beginning to my understanding of engineering, you know, and practical, real world things of fixing and trying to just figure things out. Um, you know, I didn't necessarily always have uh, the textbook knowledge, so it just kind of had to sort it out. And that, that led I think just to the greater understanding because it's not just a page out of a book, it's, it's practice. It's what, you know, it's what we do to figure out problems. Um, and as I said, oh, I think I was also aerodynamicist on this. I put some little winglets and stuff on there. Um, mostly started with some sort of cardboard that wound up with some sort of fiberglass. Um, so I, I raced that for a couple of years and um, <laughs> that led to Toyota Atlantic Racing, which is equivalent to Indy Lights Racing now. They used to travel with the IndyCar series. And this is actually uh, Milwaukee with my crew chief and my engineer. And um, I was trying to figure out why I was so slow. Um, and very much my engineer was trying to figure that out as well. So you. As I say, I raced for a number of years, um, and this whole time as well, I had my own team. Uh, and here I actually had a customer car as well. So I was not only then managing five employees, but, but trying to deal with another race car driver ego, which um, you know, as you guys get out there and maybe start working with race car drivers, hopefully if you do, if uh, that's your chosen field, you'll realize there's a lot of ego management that has to go along with it. You know, your own as well as the drivers and then the team owner. Um, team owners can actually be the worst. Um, case in point, Chip Ganassi. He's a um, very interesting guy. I worked for him uh, for about four years. Um, but I, this is really the time when I started delving more into uh, the data, data acquisition in the sport and really started to get a feel for actually being able to use it as a tool and be able to quantify um, feelings and sensations I had on the racetrack to what the data was saying. And it was a very neat process of learning that because, okay, this 
feels like that looks. And then eventually I was able to start basing decisions off of what it looked like on the computer screen coupled with what I was feeling versus just taking wild stabs in the dark. And you know, any SEA guys might understand that of, now what do we do? Oh, let's try throwing this. Let's try throwing that. And to be able to have you know, a way to quantify it, obviously, is, uh, is much better uh, all the way around. From there, uh, I think I, I raced a little bit more myself. Let's see what this is. Uh, I think this was uh, Nazareth in Pennsylvania. Extremely fun car to drive. Very complicated. This was nice because this was really before the, uh, the era of spec cars, and now most racing that we do and most engineering problems are based around uh, specified setups on the chassis of, you know, there's no changing roll centers. There may be a little bit of weight distribution you could do, but not much. Uh, shock absorbers are spec. You can adjust them, but you can't change the valving. So you're really only allowed pretty much springs, anti-roll bars, tire pressure, and a little bit of aero adjustment. But everything else is pretty locked down, even in IndyCar racing. Um, they're a little bit more open, but, but the lower series are, are pretty locked down now. So again, kind of with that, it, the ability to go out and, and work like in club racing where things aren't necessarily specified, you can actually then play with roll centers. You can play with weight dis distribution and all those really neat things where you can really see what the effects are on the car. Because again, you can work it out, you can math it out and go, okay, it should be here, should be here, should be here. But to be able to then take and put it on a race car and get the feedback from the driver, um, you realize sometimes math kind of misleads you, and that's sort of where the intuition comes in. Um, actually, a good story about that. I was working at Ganassi Racing. This was pre-IRL, so Champ Car, if that rings a bell to anyone. So mid-90s, late 90s. And uh, we were down in Monterey, Mexico. Freshly paved racetrack, and air temperature was like 105? And the asphalt temperature was about 148, if I remember correctly. And back then we had two hour practice sessions. And then there was usually about an hour in between then another two hour practice session. So there, the cars were pretty open to what you could do. So <laughs> this one particular time, um, came into the pits, you hear the engineer and the driver talking, it's like, all right, let's try a weight distribution change. Sounds easy enough, we'll just move some weight around. This entailed putting the car up on high lifts, on high stands, in pit lane, <laughs> dropping uh, about a 30 pound steel skid, putting um, tungsten blocks and bolting them into the pockets up in the bottom of the tub, and then putting a brass skid on that it took two people to hold up and one to try to get the bolts in. This is all while now we have second degree burns on our back almost. And, you know, because the, the math, again, was this should be good. It took us 18 minutes or something like that to change. Driver went out, he did two laps, came in, and on the radio, heard the engineer go back to the, the, the previous. It's like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. So now, after we just finally poured enough water down our back to kind of get cooled off, now we had to completely redo that. Um, that was one of the least favorite changes I've ever made in pit lane, for sure. And uh, I think we actually did it one more time too. But, uh, but I think that that's one of those situations where sometimes intuition plays maybe a little better part than kind of just, I, I liken it to, I, th I think engineering in the trailer, I think they can have special made spaghetti that has some sort of engineering change written on it, right? And they cook it up, and they take a handful, and they hook it at the wall, and whatever sticks, they go and pick one up. All right, weight distribution. We'll try that. <laughs> and then if that doesn't work, they'll go pick up another one. You know, it's, uh, let's try tire pressure. It's like, well, could have tried that one first. That would have taken five seconds. But, but that is the, the continual evolution 
of the way race weekends go, where you, there's never boring times at the racetrack. There never is. Uh, because you're either standing, enjoying a victory, sulking over something that's maybe not going right, or you're changing everything on the car. And then you're going, you really, it's 10.30 again at night. Oh. And then you go back next day and you do it again. So it, uh, it, it, it's a, race weekends are usually fun for that. And you wind up being dead tired when you get home. Later when I got into Indy cars, this was after Ganassi, but this was actually uh, Indy 500 2006. I was crew chief on that car. Um, so I actually changed the outside front tire, but also got to control the car in pit lane, which I've done multiple times since. Uh, personally, that's one of my favorite cars I've ever worked on. That there is a, uh, a Panos G-Force, which in the IRL became outdated, I think is it three years ago now when they've gone to the new spec? But this was still actually fairly open where you could change roll centers, uh, you could change track width, uh, you could actually also change uh, swap back, so the, the sweep back of the suspension for moving, you know, whole car weight distribution. Um, the arrow is pretty, pretty standard, but uh, again, a lot of things you could do with, with shocks, springs, um, all the way around. But the, that car in particular was actually not a very good oval car. That was a really good road course car. And actually at that time, but the, the following year after that, there were two chassis that were prominent then. There was the G-Force chassis, and then the Delara was the second. And the bigger teams, again, like Ganassi and I think Andretti, Team Andretti, they actually ran the Delara car, the other car, on the ovals, and then parallel prepped these cars for road courses. And if one brand of car between two completely different types of racing is confusing to everyone, try two completely chassis, different chassis on two completely different types of tracks. Um, you know, at that point in time, Ganassi had two drivers. They each had three of each chassis. And they were in continual rotation, depending on where they were going. And back then, there was mileage rules on engines. So if you're going from race to race, the engine had to stay the one in the car. So it didn't matter if you were changing chassis. You were always moving the same engine. And the, thankfully, an engine change in one of these cars with three, three, three people on a floater is about 45 minutes from ground to ground. So that, that certainly made it a little bit easier, but, uh, but it was still rough nonetheless. Ah, this is more current. This was not a really great picture, but it is one of our crash cars from the 24 hours of Daytona this past year. Um, this is, a, this is a, in the IMSA Tudor series. It's a PC chassis. Uh, Prototype Challenge is the name of the class. It's an Orca French-made chassis that is standardized across. So it's a spec gearbox, uh, spec engine, spec valving in the dampers. Uh, it's pretty much a spec series. And it's a gentleman series, which means um, usually if it's a shorter race when we have two drivers, we have a gentleman driver who's older and uh, usually some sort of business professional. And then we have a young, really fast guy that doesn't have any money. So they kind of pair the two together. And the young, really fast guy, he qualifies it. The gentleman will start the race. And depending on who's in with other cars, we usually go to the back of the pack. And then once he gets his time to race, we put the professional back in and we go to the front again. Um, you know, and these cars, these cars here are built to go 24 hours um, when the drivers can keep them on the track. And <laughs> unfortunately, this race, we, we were running two cars 
And both of them were out of the race by, I think, one in the morning. Um, so we were actually fully packed up in back of the hotel uh, with our feet in the ocean by, I think, 8 a.m., fully loaded up. That, uh, that was not a fun race weekend. It definitely wasn't. But if anyone ever has a chance, you know, through, uh, as mentioning, you know, trying to volunteer with race teams along the way, you know, try to build up a bit of a reputation for yourself, even if it's starting off as a gopher or, you know, wheel polisher or whatever. Um, if you ever get a chance to, to volunteer or do a 24 hour, or hopefully maybe get paid, maybe you're on the payroll now and you're, you know, doing engineering or, you know, maybe you're on the mechanical side, but they, uh, in and of themselves, 24 hour races are pretty intense. You know, you spend a lot of time in a fire suit. You look forward to the sun going down because it just cooled off 20 degrees. Um, but trying to eat with your belaclava and your helmet on because you don't know when the next pit stop might happen because you always have to be prepared, right? Driver can't come in and, what movie is that? Days of Thunder, when they're eating ice cream. Anyone maybe old enough to remember that movie? I think at least you do, right? <laughs> but that's one thing obviously you can't have happen. So you it always, um, almost from the time you get off the airplane to the time you get back on the airplane, you're in some state of having to be continuously prepared for whatever. Um, you know, especially in the engineering trailer, uh, just trying to deal with the ins and outs of, of practice sessions, qualifying sessions, and just the situations developed during the race, um, it's, it's quite incredible. Uh, you know, we do pit stops. Our fuel load is 80 liters, which that gives us about a 45 to 50 minute window, depending on the track. So you're guaranteed you're doing fuel at least every hour. And that's if we double stint tires because the tires are more durable than the fuel tank is big. But then if we're doing a driver change, you know, maybe we're doing tires. Um, you know, in a full, a full driver change with these cars, with the way our pit stop rules are, we can do a full service in about 25 seconds. Um, and then you go and you sit down for an hour. <laughs> And then you do it again. And then, you know, sometimes you go, please just double stint tires. It's the middle of the night. Really just want to have, you know, my egg McMuffin sandwich that's cold. Oh, that was our second one. I believe this was, uh, this is the sister car. This was Sebring. Uh, you'd mentioned being the Sebring, right? Yeah. That's a, yes. Who's driving past the car? <laughs> <laughs> this car. The other one. The one that you're Oh, it was, honestly, I can't remember his name. It, it, it was, no, it, it was, it was the second, the second professional. Because it was a 24 hour race, we had four drivers for each car. And it was a new kid that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> I haven't seen him since either. <laughs> and if anyone's familiar with Daytona, the road course there, it's a, the bus stop chicane right on the back straightaway. It, it interrupts the, the oval portion of the racetrack so you just don't spool up speed all the way around. You have the bus stop chicane. That's actually where he did it. I think he caught inside pothole um, and it just, it just threw the car right into the tire barrier. Yeah, 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 that was, I, I was not happy. And actually with that car, earlier in the day, our race was already shot because at that point we had, um, the engines, let me backtrack, the engines are Chevy LS3 engines, right, kind of uh, Corvette-ish type, so you push rods, uh, pretty basic engines, but I think it was about 45 minutes into the race, we, we broke a lifter. <laughs> yeah. So we were taking the cylinder head off back in the paddock and finally managed to get it all put back together. Um, and then young dude went out and crashed. It's like, oh. <laughs> and then this one, I think this was our gentleman driver, uh, Chris Cummings, who did this one. Uh, in fairness, he's the one that pays for that whole thing, so, hmm. Yeah, give him a box of broken parts and say, see you next time. <laughs> yeah. And I think this one was actually uh, 
team manager sent me back from pit lane uh, because I, I heard the talk on the radio. It's like, well, we'll go back to the truck and we'll fix it. We'll be back out in an hour. So I'm running down there. I get to the car. I start kind of peeling up bodywork and looking. I get on the radio and I just start listing off everything that's broke. He's like, okay, pack up. <laughs> But it's that thing, it's like, it doesn't matter how much damage, we can fix it. So, well, no, we, we, we can't, not that, no. For next race, perhaps. Um, I actually left that team halfway through the season. I say I wanted to find a little better fit. Um, so I wound up, this is the Starworks team. And the, uh, the number eight car here is actually the car I'm crew chief on. And then the seven car is our sister car. This was taken at uh, Virginia last month month before that, something like that. Um, so at least it's nice to see cars when they're actually in one piece. Yeah. Uh, they, they're actually, interestingly enough, they're actually never really in the fully assembled state very often. It's that span of time between Wednesday and Sunday at the racetrack. If you can roll them onto the trailer, the minute they get back to the shop, they're fully blown apart. You know, they magnaflux and crack check things that need to be checked. Mileage engines, if and when they need to be mileage out and changed, and just general uh, looking over. The, the, although these cars in particular are built to go 24 hours, it's amazing how all the little silly things will break along the way. And uh, you know, during a race weekend, mechanics, electrical and mechanical engineers like to throw band-aids on cars because, oh, we'll get to that in the shop but no one ever actually gets to it at the shop. And that, that, that goes, it doesn't matter which race team I've ever worked for, it's been like that. So, you, you know, I'm used to showing up at the racetrack and doing wiring, fixing, you know, pulling looms out, fixing looms, putting them back in, um, you know, it, changing crazy setup stuff on the car. Um, needless to say, fun. And I think that's actually my last photo. Like I said, I kind of apologize for my photos. Yeah, that's the last one. So I don't really have anything wonderful, but yeah, kind of cool nonetheless. So I, I know I, I asked before, but do, does anyone do any sort of volunteering or anything? Do I try to racetrack stuff? You, you do some stuff? Okay, so at least a couple. Of, okay, nice. And you guys enjoy it, obviously, right? It's a nice place to start, for sure. Um, that's kind of most of what I had. I, if anyone has any specific questions, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I kind of like the back and forth talk a little bit more than me being a blowhard. Um, <laughs> if there's any questions, yes. So could you tell us a, a few, you know, kind of pointers on if, if anybody in the room wanted to get involved? Like what, what are some things you'd, you'd recommend picking up? Um, a lot of it's networking. Obviously, like everything else is nowadays. You know, we're lucky here. We have Blackhawk Farms that's out by Rockton near Rockford. We have Elkhart Lake for road stuff. There's even I think some dirt racing around, isn't there? That I'm not real well versed in, but it's really just a, a matter of of being there and networking and just asking, hey, can, hey, can I help move that stack of tires? You know, and a lot of times. Um, Especially smaller teams are always looking for help. And you know, once you get in, they, they learn you, you kind of learn them, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, can you, you know, grab that half inch wrench and uh, make sure that you know, suspension bolt is tight. And it kind of goes from there, and maybe along the way, you know, our dad guy's sick. You, you guys, you know how to work a computer? Yeah, I happen to know how to work a computer. You know, there's uh, certainly nowadays, the neat thing is, is Data acquisition has gotten so much more available now than 15 years ago. You know, back then you had to get Pi Research, English-based company where you couldn't even get software out of them unless you paid an enormous amount of money. But now I think like AIM and there's some, some other lower uh, entry level data where you can actually, I think you can even download basic um, software off the internet. And you know they have sample uh, data, so you can kind of just start viewing and start learning. You know what the squigglies mean, and you know I assume probably most of you guys have some sort of data acquisition experience from here. Is there some sort of classes here for it? Yeah. Okay. I, f I figured as much, but I didn't want to presume. <laughs>
But that's, you know, it, it's all those things that you can bring to the table. Um, you know, and teams appreciate it when you come in and ask to do the worst job that's there. They, putting players on. Yes, yeah. Versus showing up and saying, you know, I'll, I'll offer to be your lead mechanic. It's like, well, well no. <laughs> I have one of those. But again, I need those tires put on. All right, nice job. Now, can you take them off? <laughs> Anything else? Yes? But, um, with this racing series, are you guys limited to the number of engines you have for the whole season? No, we actually aren't, but, but I, the engine is actually good to run a whole season. Okay. It's, it's literally a detuned crate engine that um, we, we run a, a, a restrictor plate on it that re restricts it down to give or take 450 horsepower at the wheels. And uh, the whole drive line is good for almost 600. So it, it's nice because the moving parts are very understressed, uh, which is good. You know, obviously you gotta keep the mufflers packed. That's, you know, throw a clean air filter in it and you know, change the oil filter every once in a while. That's pretty much it. You know, which I'm really grateful for because this installation is actually not very well thought out <laughs> uh, because it was a retrofit in, in Europe where the chassis has run um, about six years over there. They use a little higher tech engines. So actually the, the, the mounting systems were a bit more user friendly because literally to get some bolts from the engine to the back of the back of the chassis to get a few of those um, is extremely difficult. Where, you know, when it's thought out ahead of time, it's, you know, 10 minutes to pull an engine, but, you know, not that one. So, at least I'm, I'm grateful for that. Even though a few races ago, oh, at Indy, we were racing on the road course and we actually, we lost power steering about 20 minutes into it. Turned out we got a piece of debris up in the pulley, serpentine belt and it just shredded the serpentine belt. I mean, there, there wasn't anything longer than this. I mean, it's a, it, you know, it's a full length belt. So we pushed all the way back to the truck, went up on high stands, dropped the floor, and we're trying to feed a new belt up and in. But of course, there's only about three eighths of an inch air gap between the front of the pulleys and the, and the back of the chassis. So we wound up, you know, loosen all the nuts and bolts, back it off, as much as we dared to, that still didn't work. Backed it off a little more, a little more. Next thing you know, the thing's four feet behind and we're changing belts. You know? But by then, um, because it was a shorter race, we just we hit the time where there was no points left in it. So after all that, I just put it back together and loaded it in the truck. It's like, oh, okay. But, uh, but that's one of those small things, you know, a piece of debris, um, you know, like anything else, yeah, as we look at race cars, got to make sure there's no debris around. You know, that, that one little bolt you might hear go tink, tink, that's the one that gets you. Yeah. I was just going to ask, uh, out of all the different series you've been on, I mean, what would you say would be like a down-to-earth person's most fun? Because, I mean, most people can't go out and pay for like a Daytona Challenge. Car. Right. But, I mean, you were talking about before you did SCCA. Yeah. You know, you can go run SCCA with, with, a Miata, right? I think they still have a Miata series, don't they? Yeah. And I mean, it's I, it, fun per dollar spent. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I do suggest if anyone's looking at doing that, at least buy an open trailer and haul the race car to the racetrack. Because this is going back a number of years, but I kind of made note this one morning. Guy drives his Miata into the track, gets out, opens up the trunk, pulls out these things, I'm just kind of watching it, takes it, slaps it on the side, magnetic stickers. So he's putting his race numbers on. It's like, huh, okay. Fast forward about eight hours, see him over on the, uh, on the landline, and he must have been calling his wife because you kind of pan over, and there's his wrecked race car. <laughs> it's like, dude, you're so not driving that home. <laughs> and that, that, you know, so that's one suggestion I can make. But yeah, go-karts, just if you want to get into it, go-karts are 
pretty inexpensive. You can get a touch and go cart pretty inexpensive just to get in. Yes? Um, you all have started. 